Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Dean Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma. And I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. Dee, I'd like to start with a little thought for our opening this time. I like it. Go for it. Is there a better month in the garden than May when the skies are blue, the garden is lush, and there are flowers blooming in every color imaginable? The promises of the season have yet to be broken, and optimism reigns. Man, that sounds like something you'd see in a book. Well, it's something I wrote. Maybe it'll show up in a book someday. I like it. It's true. Thank you. Is there a prettier month than May? I don't think so. I don't think so either. So speaking of pretty, guess what's blooming today in my garden? I don't know. Tell me. I have some clematis that are blooming, and that happens to be our flower this week. It is our flower this week, and it's a member of your favorite family. Can I say it? Of course. Ranunculaceae. I don't know if I could say it if I tried. Ranunculaceae. <laughs> I used to think this, this is the buttercup family. And when I was in college, I used to think that it was a boring old family because I didn't know much about it. And it's my favorite plant family now. Yes, everyone knows. Everyone knows how yes. much you like it. <laughs> so clematis. Or clematis. Or clematis, depending on where you're from. Do you say clematis or clematis? I say clematis, I think. Me too. But I think a lot of our friends on the East Coast say clematis. Yeah, peony, peony, who cares? All right, so back in the day, there were just big vine clematis that you could buy locally, like Jack Monty is one of them, and I still like Jack Monty, but now you can find clematis in almost every shape and size. Large flowering clematis that vine, you can find the small flowering clematis that vine, you can find bush clematis. And you can find short vines, and you can find long vines, and you can find bell-shaped flowers and wide-open flowers. There's something for everybody in the clematis genus. But I think there's no plant that causes more consternation and confusion than trying to grow clematis. There's a lot of information out there about it, and it's a little bit like compost information. It's so much that it's hard. You see what I'm saying? It is, and people get very confused because people tend to classify all the clematis into different groups that have different pruning requirements, and yes, that just kind of freaks people out that they're going to make a mistake. I remember when I first started really getting serious about gardening with roses, that was probably, oh gosh, 40, almost 40 years ago, and clematis were making a surge. It seems like every 15 years clematis become a thing again you know like they become in fashion and they were in fashion back then and I used to read over magazines and books and try to figure out how do I plant them how do I make them grow what makes them happy remember they used to say plant them so that their roots are in the shade and their vines can reach the sun right that was one of the things that they told us right well that used to freak me out because I couldn't figure out how you could get the roots in the shade as a as a new young gardener but now I just know I mulch them. They're in the shade. <laughs> yeah, you just mulch them. They just don't want to get all dried out. Right. They like moisture. So my advice is plant them somewhere where they're going to be, you know, in a sunny area. But it doesn't have to be full sun because some of them will grow really well in partial shade. Especially my little bush type clematis. It grows really well in partial shade. But for the vining ones... I like to grow them at the base of um, roses, for example, a classic combination. Yes, because the rose acts as the trellis for the clematis, and the clematis just kind of climbs up through it and takes over. Yes, it does. And I have one that's really pretty that climbs in my Carefree Beauty Rose, and it's Pope John Paul II. Oh, that sounds nice. It is. It's really pretty. I have a fairly large one that's got beautiful white flowers and I had it climbing up through a bayberry shrub and I this spring the bayberry just sort of half leafed out I thought I'm tired of it so I cut it way back and there's that poor clematis laying on the ground so I grabbed a a wrought iron chair and set it down for it to sort of sit on until something else grows in its place for it to vine up 
I had a similar experience this year too. I used to have a pink knockout rose in this area and I replaced it with a boxwood, a vertical mm-hmm. boxwood and, um, clematis aren't going to grow well on a boxwood. So I looked, I found one. It's one of my best ones too. I think it's queen of Holland. Anyway, I was looking at it and I felt kind of bad for it. So I stretched it out onto a fence and it's doing fine, but you know, at least it's doing fine until this weather blows through Oklahoma. It might not be here anymore after that. Yeah, let's pause for a minute because you are going to get some terrible weather blow through. Supposedly we are. They uh, have sent out a warning for today, a warning that you don't see. I think I've only seen it twice before in my lifetime. And both times that they did this, it was a bad day. And they're saying it's going to start this afternoon about the time we finish this podcast and uh, recording it. And then it's going to go on till at least 10 p.m. tonight. So nighttime tornadoes, which are the worst, but they are. So in terms of clematis vine, one of the things is if they don't have a good support, um, they're a vine and they'll scramble through the garden and they'll, they'll try to find something to grow up. And, and sometimes mine sort of miss the trellis a little bit. And so I have to use string or even fishing line to kind of train it to go back to where I need it to go. Huh. I've never done that. Um, I use like chicken wire fencing. There's some that's got a coating on it that's green, so it doesn't really show up. And so like on my split rail fence, I have a piece of that that I bent around the two top rails. I have a three rail split rail fence around my part, one part of my garden. I do that there. And then I also shape it around my crepe myrtle trees because I'm growing Jack Monty in my pink crepe myrtle so that you get purple and pink. Oh, well, that's nice. I have uh, sweet summer love that grows on service berry trees, and so it's it kind of disappears in all the foliage. And then midsummer, I look up and there's clematis blooms like 15 feet up in the air. <laughs> yeah, same with these. Sweet summer love is one of the most popular clematis. It sold out last year. I couldn't find it anywhere, so I still don't have it. But I don't know where I'd put it anyway. I have a lot of clematis in my garden. And I shall we talk real quickly about when do you cut them back and the three different pruning groups and at what we actually do? Well, (laughs) yeah, you tell us the three pruning groups, and then we'll tell um, everybody what we do to make things simple. I don't remember the three pruning groups. I just know there are three pruning groups. The truth of the matter is... I gave up on that a long time ago because it's sort of like that shaded root thing. It's much simpler than that in my garden and yours. It is. What (laughs) I do in the spring before it really gets to start leafing out, I just cut them all back to about a foot tall and throw the old vines away. Yeah, because there's supposedly some of them only bloom on old wood and some only bloom on new wood. Well, I guess all mine bloom on new wood. Because I cut them all back. (laughs) Right. Well, what happens, I think, is the ones that bloom on, quote, unquote, old wood, um, by cutting them back in the spring, you're basically delaying the bloom until later in the summer until that wood gets a chance to harden off a little bit. So you'll still get blooms. You'll just get them later in the season. Right. It's not like those old-fashioned mop head hydrangeas that you cut back and you just don't get any blooms at all. So... So here's the deal. We just cut ours back. And I just don't worry about it. And one thing I did learn from watching a show a long time ago, and it might be the same lady in Ohio that's the clematis, amazing clematis lady that you're going to talk about. Yes. Um, It might have been a show on her because this lady was from Ohio, and she had a ton of clematis. What she did is she would cut them at different heights to get flowers at different heights. Yeah, you can do that. Her name is Deborah Hardwick, and she is on Facebook. You can find her. And also, she's the the Clematis Guru on Twitter. And I've heard her speak twice. And the thing she says is people think that the Clematis is this very mysterious, very difficult plant, all those instructions. And she says, remember, it's a perennial, and you're used to dealing with perennial flowers in your garden. And so just treat it like a perennial flower in your garden, and it'll be fine. Exactly. I just treat them like any other plant in my garden. The one thing I do help them with is I make sure that I put back to nature on them every year, which is my, it's kind of a mulch, kind of an additive, and it has some good um, 
some good nitrogen in it and some other stuff because it's made with cottonseed holes and also manure. And it really does help them. And I also have the ones that are planted beneath the roses. Well, they get fed the same thing the roses get, which is that rose that Mills Rose Magic. And so they do appreciate a good feeding. I have noticed that. Right. And I think they also appreciate very good draining soil. They don't like to be in heavy clay. No, they don't like clay at all. So if you have clay, Oklahoma people, I don't know, do Indiana people have clay? We have tons of clay. Oh, okay. Well, Indiana and Oklahoma people and anybody else in the world that has tons of clay, don't put your clematis there. Put them in a raised bed. All of mine are kind of in raised soil except for the ones in the lower garden, but it's really good draining soil because I live in a part that has pockets of clay, but mostly I have red red sandy soil. Good advice. So let's talk a little. So everybody thinks about the clematis vines and they have the big open flowers, but some of my favorite clematis are the bush types, which is clematis integrifolia. And yes. There's a very beautiful blue flower one. And there's also, I have one called Alba, which is a white flower. And it has a, a bell-shaped flower, mm-hmm. more so than the big open flower. Now, are these the bush type ones with the bell flowers or the ones that grow as vines with the bell flowers? Cause no, have, these these are the bush type. That's right. And then the ones, aren't the ones that grow, and I'm just, I'm pulling this out of nowhere, so I may not be saying this right, but I know one of them is... Uh, Texensis, there's a Texensis that's got a bell shaped flower um, that's a vine, right? Is that right? Is yes. that a vine? Yeah, that's correct. Because I have both. I have one that's a bell shaped flower that grows as a vine, and then I have that Montana clematis that has a bell shaped flower that's more of a bush type. It's blue. Right. And then there's another one I have. It's, um, I'm going to but- butcher this name. It's Clematis. Heraclifolia. I don't and think the variety you is it. Mrs. Robert Bryden. <laughs> so if you search on Mrs. Robert Bryden, you find it. But it's, I'll call it a large shrub. It's either a large shrub or a short vine, and it needs support. But it's got little tiny purple and white flowers on it. It's very pretty. It blooms later in the summer. Sounds lovely. And do you use like a peony support for it? Yes. The the bush type clematis, whatever you're using to support your peonies, would work to support them as well. Just sort of like a hoop. Right. So I have this friend up in Tulsa. I have a quick little story about that, about supports. I have this friend up in Tulsa. Hi, Beth. Beth Teals. I think she listens to us. And Beth actually goes to places like Goodwill and she buys lampshades and then she pulls all the stuff, you know, the fabric off the lampshade and think about it. It uh-huh. becomes a peony support. She turns them upside right. down, you know, so the smaller part is at the bottom, right next to the soil, and the bigger part is at the top. And they make very effective peony, clematis, whatever needs support, because there's a whole lot of things that we grow that really can use some support, and it's cheap. Right. And if you didn't like the metal, you could just spray paint it green. It would just disappear into the garden. Exactly. No one would notice it. I think that's pretty cool. Right. Then that's the way to have support in the garden. You don't want a bunch of stakes all sticking up funny. and Yeah, if you can help it. Now, sometimes with my big lilies, I have to use rebar, and then I have to tie them up to the rebar because they're just so heavy. But um, since I now have this creature in my garden that's been stomping around, we don't know what it is. I'm going to have to put out a critter cam. Um, but I'm guessing it's a deer. And it doesn't seem to be eating anything, but I think my dog is chasing it through the garden. And so, yeah, I've lost some lilies and some other stuff. So I won't have to have any support at all before long. Dee, you're going to put up a critter cam? Maybe it's Bigfoot. I doubt it, but maybe. You know, we're supposed to have a native Bigfoot in Oklahoma. Did you know that? Well, this is... This is exciting. I can't wait for you to put up the camera and tell me what you see. <laughs> it's a foggy bottom monster. That's what the one that's called. That's a Bigfoot in our state. Anyway, so well, back to clematis. That's going to be interesting. <laughs> well, so there is a clematis um, that can be a problem, and that's sweet autumn yeah. clematis, clematis turnifolia. 
It is from yeah. Japan and it is invasive and people should not plant it. Right, because I still see it for sale occasionally. And every August when it blooms all over town, people think it's beautiful. But here's the deal. It ought to be called Clematis terrible Atholia because it's just one of the worst plants ever. And it's invasive almost everywhere. And it's hard to get out and it reseeds in my garden and I hate it. I hate it with a passion. But D, it smells so good. But Carol, it's horrible, and it also attracts wasps. They're the ones that pollinate it. Not that they'll hurt you, but they're kind of a nuisance when they're all over it in your garden. Right. And then there's another fall-blooming clematis, clematis virginiana, which also has long vines. It is native to the United States, and um, we would call it aggressive, and it's probably not a good choice for most gardens. Right, it should live where it lives normally. But it is a native, and so it's not considered invasive. It's aggressive, which we will talk about that later in our dirt. We will. So two other things I want to say about clematis. Okay. Uh, I want to tell you my two favorite varieties, which are purple blooms, and they are Raguchi Mm -hmm. and Pagoda. And Raguchi has more of the bell shape. And pagoda has, it's a bell, but the, the, the petals are twisted. Yes. So it's really pretty. I have one that looks like that, too. That has the, they look like a bell, but it kind of has a little twist. It's real pretty. My Queen of Holland yes. does that. It's not exactly a bell, but it opens up with a twist, I would say. And it's small, a small flowered one. That's one of my favorites, too. I also like Hoovy. H-U-V-I, and it's part of that Polish group of clematis. There was a Polish breeder who came out with a lot of improvements to clematis, and one of the improvements was that these don't get clematis wilt. Clematis wilt used to be a real problem with earlier cultivars. It was a problem, and your, your plant would look really healthy, and then one day you'd go out, and it would be wilted. And I still get a lot of calls about those because people have Jack Money, like I do, and Jack Money is very prone to the wilt. And so if you get that, you just chop it all the way down to the ground, say goodbye to it for that year because it's black anyway, and then you just throw that in the trash and take it away. Do not put it in your compost pile. You call it Jack Money. I call it Jack Money. I don't have that one. You don't? Nope. Well, it's a really pretty dark purple, has a smaller flower than like Hoovy, one of the big flowered ones, um, but it's it's a really exquisite shade of purple. I think that's why people still grow it. Yeah, it is, and um, it's it's worth growing. Yeah, but not as, fl- not as floriferous as some of the other ones, though, you know? Oh, no. If you want to see some really pretty clematis, there is an online nursery site called Brushwood Nursery. And they have tons of beautiful, beautiful clematis. And you can browse their site. And I guarantee as soon as you see one you fall in love with, it's probably sold out. So you got to shop early. That's the truth. You want to hear another little trivia about clematis? Sure. Well, it's not really trivia. I used to work uh, one summer in a ground cover nursery and we propagated clematis. So I spent several summer days taking cuttings off clematis vines and cutting them up and getting them prepared to be rooted. So Wow. I know how to root clematis. I don't. If I wanted to. But good on you. It's, it's really easy. Is it easy? easy? Okay. It's easy. I rooted a rose once. That wasn't so easy. Takes a little more work. No. So that's my the first time I really had a chance to see clematis other than just the big purple flowers that there were all these other ones that I had no idea existed. Mm-hmm. And so that's why you're such a big fan now? Well, I think Raguchi's what sucked me in. <laughs> the bell-shaped ones. That's what, that's what got me going. The bell-shaped ones do have a lot of flowers, and they are really, really pretty. I have so many. I, I like Niobe, too. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but she's beautiful also. I have her climbing up an uh, apricot uh, flat rose. And that's a, it's really stunning. But I almost always weed her out at the beginning of the year because I forget she's there when I'm really going through my garden. Do you ever do that? Because they look dead. Weed something out that was not supposed to be weeded out? Yeah, that. Yeah, that. <laughs> um, 
we're recording this, aren't we, Dee? I'm not going to confess to something like that. You know darn we're well you've done to- it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you have a joke for us before we move on to veggies. I do have a joke. Well, let's just wrap up clematis by saying everybody should... There's a place in every garden for a clematis because there are so many different varieties. So go get one. Yeah, I thought that was kind of understood. I just wanted to wrap it up nicely for people before I give them this bit of wisdom, which you're calling a joke. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard this the other day. If April showers bring May flowers, what do May flowers bring? I don't know. What do they bring? Pilgrims. <laughs> Pilgrims. Okay. <laughs> get it? The Mayflowers? I get Mayflowers. it. I get it. I get okay. it. Okay. I wanted to make sure. I was laughing. Give people. Okay. <laughs> All right. So in May, we were talking about the differences in timing in our gardens. So for vegetables, we wanted to talk about people who are, let's call them procrastinators. Okay. And they haven't quite got everything planted. And Memorial Day rolls around, which is coming up this weekend. Is it Memorial Day weekend this weekend? I think it is. Yes, it is. I think um, I heard there's a race in town here. What's it called? The Indy 500? <laughs> I think so. If only you had Jim Neighbors to sing the song. Oh, yeah. Did I ever tell you when summer officially begins in Indiana? I believe you have, but not everybody else knows. So summer in Indiana officially begins the moment they sing back home again in Indiana to start the Indianapolis 500 race. All right. Fire up the barbecue. Get out the kiddie pool. It's summertime in Indiana. Coming on up. Well, you know, it's Memorial Day this weekend, so I'll say that that's the official start. Well, you could say tornado season is the official start to summertime in Oklahoma. But anyway, yeah, Memorial Day. So let's talk about people who haven't started their vegetable gardens yet. And we're talking about your summer vegetable garden, which, by the way, we have a whole episode just on a basic summer vegetable garden. So if you haven't heard that one, it's not a weekly episode. It's a bonus episode. And if you've never had a vegetable garden or you're not sure what to plant, we go through everything with you. But if you haven't started your vegetable garden yet, it's too late to plant peas and radishes and turnips and lettuce and spring onions. Those it's that's too late all, for lettuce too and spinach. <laughs> Those are all done now. So you you can just breathe a sigh of relief. Don't be upset. Just breathe a sigh of relief and go. Whew! I didn't have to plant those. I can just move on to the summer crops. But you need to get with it. If you're in Oklahoma, but if you're in Indiana, you got more time in Indiana. And especially since it's been a cool spring, we still got a couple of weeks. Now I target to actually plant my summer vegetables Memorial Day weekend. So I'm right on schedule for green beans and tomatoes and peppers and corn. But if it got into June and I hadn't planted, I would still plant those things. It's not too late in Indiana. Yeah, and I try to get everything in by June 6th, except that you can plant succession plantings of certain vegetables like squash. You might want to plant squash later, for example, because there's some thought that if you plant squash later, summer squash, you don't get squash bugs as bad. Now, I'll be honest, in my garden, you could plant squash bugs in Dece- squash in December and squash bugs would find them if they were above ground. But I hear that that's a good thing. and But as far as like green beans, you're going to plant successive rows of those anyway. So if you don't make it by June 6th or June 15th, don't worry about it. Just go on and plant them. Same with corn. Corn likes warm soil. And we have been really cold this spring. As we have been. I heard there's going to be snow in like Denver this week or something. Why, you scared me. You, I, I thought you were going to say Indianapolis. And I'm like, we don't have that in our <laughs> forecast. Oh my gosh, don't do that to me. <laughs> Stop. No, no, no. I think this cold front that's coming down and causing the weather havoc in my state has either been through Colorado and dumped some snow or something like that. So what I'm trying to say is we have been cold throughout the United States unless you live in the far south. Right. So... And one other, one other vegetable that really likes warm and 
uh, soil and it's the very last thing I plant if I decide to plant it because it's a huge, big vine and that's pumpkins. Right. And you want your pumpkins to mature by October or September for, your de- you know, it depends on if you want to use them for decor or what you're using them for. So if you're going to plant them, you're going to plant them much later anyway. And I would say melons too. All melons. They are. Kind yes. Of, yeah. Melons and squash. And okra. And okra. Yeah. So, see, you got time. Yeah. So procrastinators out there who think, well, I I skirted by, it's too late now, I don't have to plant a vegetable garden. No, get out of your chair, get out to your garden, listen to our podcast about the basic vegetable garden and go out there and plant anyway. Yeah, go for it. And oh, one more thing we wanted to be sure and tell you, if you're going to start really late, Buy the biggest plants you can find of tomatoes and peppers. And I would suggest that if they have fruit on them, I would pull it off. Would you pull it off or would you leave it on there to ripen? I would I would pull it off. Yeah, because you want the plant to put some energy into its root system. And if it's trying to mature a fruit, it isn't going to put as much into its root system. So don't buy the tomato with full tomatoes all over it. And then, you know, because that may be all the tomatoes you get. Right. That's good advice, Dee. Thanks. You want to talk about the dirt? Our dirt this week takes us back to the sweet autumn clematis. It's about garden thugs or all the plants we've planted so you don't have to. Right. And it, <laughs> So the definition, you want to give the definition of aggressive versus invasive? So a plant is considered invasive if it's readily able to spread into natural areas and poses a threat to disrupting the ecosystems there. And that information comes from the Illinois Extension Service. And I think of invasives as plants that came in from other countries, other continents. Right, because you can have native plants that are very aggressive in your garden, but they are not I mean, they're just not invasive. Invasive plants take over areas that would normally have um, would normally have native plants in them. And a good example of that in the state of Oklahoma is Juniperus virginiana, which is actually native to Virginia, hence the name Virginiana. But it was brought here in Oklahoma as a fence row, and there's some thought that it's been here a long time. But all, in the last I'd say 50 years, it has become extremely invasive in Oklahoma because we don't burn off whole sections of the state on purpose every year. When Native Americans were living here, especially the Plains tribes, and they still live here, but they don't, they don't, you know, they aren't nomads like they were in the past. Anyway, when they were, when they were leading nomadic lives and they were hunting buffalo or bison, they would burn off areas of the prairie. And now people have houses on those areas that they live in full time. So you don't want to have that happen. Right. And so the, the um, Juniperus virginiana just continues to grow and grow and grow and spread itself all over the state because it doesn't burn it out. Mm-hmm. And suck up 50 gallons of water. Right. It doesn't burn it out. I didn't explain that very well. Well, but here in Indiana, we have um, the Japanese honeysuckle is very invasive in our wooded Ugh. lots, and I tell people, they're like, well, what does it look like? And I say, if you drive around in the fall after the leaves have dropped, you'll see all this low, shrubby stuff in the woods that's green. All that is Japanese honeysuckle, and it is horrible, horrible, horrible. And so we want to try to get rid of that in any time we can, and there's some areas where they ask people to come and help volunteer and they try to they try to dig it out they have special tools that kind of um act as almost like jackhammers to try to pull them out and and they will um oftentimes cut them and then put brush killer on the stumps to try to get rid of them in their mm-hmm. natural areas and and um I've seen pictures of before and after um and before with the area is just full of Japanese honeysuckle and then they clear it out and then that next spring, suddenly all these wildflowers, native wildflowers, have a chance again. And they, they return to the area, so to speak. They, they have a chance. Right, because the native flowers just can't compete with things like sweet autumn clematis, 
uh, that pear tree that is so Calorie invasive pear. all over the place. The caliper pear. Bread for yes. pear. Um, which, which mixes, yeah, bread for pear. And so what we've done is sometimes we bring in plants that we think are really good plants, and then we find out later that they set seed. Ligustrum is another oh, yeah. one of those that's a problem. But in my particular garden, I'm going to tell you some stuff I planted that I really wish I had not planted. And the first one would be garlic chives. Garlic chives can be invasive in some places. I have almost eradicated it in my garden by digging it, and I have used brush killer on it. I do believe that for some things, you have to use some type of brush killer, and most of those have glyphosate in them. Um, So there are times when glyphosate is necessary. Um, Also, I also have Japanese honeysuckle, which I cannot get rid of in any way. I've tried my whole entire 30 years of being married here. I want want people to note, though, that I did not bring that here. My husband did because it was in his grandmother's garden, and he was affectionate toward it. So he brought it here, and so I still have it. Um, Autumn clematis, I planted as a young, young gardener here 30 years ago. I'm still digging up pieces of it. And I also paint it with glyphosate when I find it. You know, I cut it down to the nubbing, and then I take a paintbrush and paint it on there because that's the easiest way to make it go away. Obedient plant is another one. Um, Yeah, a friend gave that to me when I was a young gardener. And then I've got Kentucky mint. I have never planted a Bradford pear, and I'm really glad I haven't. So that's one I haven't planted. There is also an Oklahoma invasive plant list, and there's one from for Indiana, too, and we're going to list those. But most states have at least one invasive plant list. What about your garden, Carol? Well, in my garden, um, I planted spiderwort, which is uh, trades cantia. It's a native, but it's very aggressive, and it self sows all over, and I wish I hadn't planted it. Um, I planted perennial sweet peas, which my grandmother had, grandmother and grandfather had growing along the side of their house in southern Indiana. And that is an aggressive vine. And I pulled it out at least 15 years ago, and I still am pulling out seedlings that are very deeply rooted. So I wish I hadn't planted perennial sweet peas. I wish I hadn't planted tansy, which is an herb. Uh, Tansy self sows all over. Um, I'm pulling out plants 15 years later and I didn't plant these in my garden, but I find seedlings all the time for Euonymus fortunii, which is a vine. It's on the, it's banned in Indiana now. Uh, you can't sell it. Flowering pear, obviously I pull up seedlings for that because there's people in the neighborhood have it. And then Japanese honeysuckle seedlings show up because it's in all the woods around here. So Mm -hmm. those aren't native. They're all invasive. And I I get people say, well, uh, you know, I've never had a problem in my yard. Well, look at the natural areas that are away from your yard. Those plants are invasive. But Mm -hmm. here's the funny thing. Not funny, ironic. When I studied horticulture back in the late 70s, Japanese honeysuckle, flowering pears, Euonymus fortunii, we're all taught to us as good landscape plants that now we've learned the hard way, way that they cannot be trusted. They're thugs. And also one more thing is that things that are planted in one part of the country will do just fine. But say in another part of the country, they're horribly invasive. And I, one I think of right off the top of my head is butterfly bush. I was thinking the same one. Butterfly bush in, in the middle part of the United States is not invasive it's not invasive in oklahoma or anywhere or anywhere that i know of in the middle part of the united states however in the west um in oregon washington california it's a nightmare and people so people will see a plant in like i'll have visitors from out of state they will come here and visit me and they'll be like oh my gosh you have a butterfly bush and i'm like yes because it's not invasive here and there are a lot of plants like that in my garden there's not very much that's invasive in oklahoma the running joke is it's hard enough to get stuff to grow right. here period um, because we have such severe weather changes but there are a few things and then there are other things that are aggressive and one that i can think of cuz i'm looking at it right now out my kitchen window is monarda 
Minarda is a very aggressive plant in my garden, um, but it's beautiful. Bees love it, but it is not invasive. So a lot of times when people come through, they'll say things like that something, even Oklahomans will say, oh, that's invasive in my garden. Rebecca is another one, not the Fulgita, the other Rebecca, um, the perennial one, the reliably perennial one in Oklahoma. It is... Um, It is very aggressive in my garden, especially if it's a wet year like this year. I cannot keep ahead of the black-eyed Susans. Right. And aggressive sometimes, depending on how big your garden is and how you want it to fill in, aggressive may not be bad if it's easy to pull out the seedlings and kind of contain it. But invasive is just simply not a good thing. That. That's a horrible thing to end up in a garden with invasive plants. And the problem is, is they don't just stay in your garden. Like you said before, they go in everybody else's garden. So now that we've shared that all the aggressive and invasive plants that we can think of right off the top of our heads, you don't have to grow them. So my advice is do not put garlic chives in your garden in Oklahoma. You'll be digging them out for the next 30 years. That's just one example. Right. And so there's, there's a, Sort of a tip off is somebody hands you a start of a plant and says, I have so much of this in my garden. Will you take some? That's a red flag that says, hmm, why do they have so much in their garden? And so you'll say, if it's, it might be a native plant, so it might be just aggressive. And then you think, well, aggressive might be okay. It could be an invasive and then you can help educate them. But or or if you have a lot of something in your garden and think, geez, I have a lot of black-eyed Susans. I should give these away. You, you have put up your hand right now and take an oath as a gardener that you will never thrust upon another gardener a plant that's aggressive without fully disclosing what it could do. Yeah, I always tell people, because I've got some great spreading mums and some wonderful asters, and people want pieces of it, and I'm like, yes, you can have a piece, but I'm just going to tell you up front. It is, they are aggressive plants. They want to be the only plant in the garden. And um, they don't always believe me, but then sometimes years later they come back and they go, oh, my gosh, those Sheffield mums. And I'm like, I know, I told you. So I try my best not to do it to people. But what I was thinking of and what I was laughing about was well, the part where you said educate them. I thought to myself, just run away like <laughs> mint. The running joke is give a new gardener mint. And they will think they're the best gardener in the world, but they will curse you later. Yeah, because they'll have mint everywhere and they think, my thumb is green. Look at all the mint I've grown. Yeah. And I felt, and a friend gave me obedient plant, which in my garden is a nightmare. I know in some people's gardens, it does great. Um, And it's just a wonderful plant. But here, I guess my garden's too damp and the soil is heavy enough that it just... It's happy with those lateral stems. By the way, that's another educational thing. Anything with a square stem is in the mint family. So (laughs) it's going to spread. And that includes some salvias. Yes. All right. So now we've got everybody afraid to plant everything in their garden or anything in their garden. No, no. I hope not. No, we haven't. But we've hopefully given people something to think about in terms of invasives and aggressives and Always, always, always check the invasive plant list before you buy something that you don't know much about. In Indiana, we do have some new rules that make it illegal to sell certain invasive plants, but not all invasive plants are illegal to sell. So buyer beware. Educate yourself. So do you have, a, have another gardening quote for us? Do I have another? About May? Do I have another quote about May? Mm-hmm. Uh, I can make one up. Okay, make one up. Okay, so this is a quote that I tell people. This is why my blog is called May Dreams Gardens. You ready? I'm ready. All year I dream of the days of May when the sky is blue, the grass is green, the sun is warm, and the garden is all new again. May Dreams Gardens. Ooh, I like it. Well, thank you. I think that's, that's, see, we ended on a happy note. We did. And so let's happily tell people that they can find us on Instagram. They can find us on Facebook. They can find us on Twitter where we are. The, we are the Garden Angelist. They can email us at thegardenangelist at gmail.com. We've gotten a few emails. We love to answer questions for people and help out however we can. 
Yes, we do. This week we answered a question about blueberries, right? about how to grow blueberries in pots. So feel free to, to contact us at any of those places. And next week we will tell you how we met because we had another listener ask us how we met. We'll do that. Okay. So if you like us on iTunes, we also would love a review. Five stars, of course. And with that, D, I've got to get back out to the garden because unlike Oklahoma, the weather is good here. Well, it looks beautiful here, too. It's just a little cloudy, but the air is kind of heavy. So we'll see how things go. It was great chatting with you over the garden gate. And great chatting with you as well. Bye, D. Bye.